Thank you, Andrew, and thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, I want to follow on directly from where Sammy uh, left off uh, in terms of um, my feelings when I watched the, uh, the television programmes last night about the London conference where um, the rulers of Europe and uh, many other parts of the world, um, including Hillary Clinton, came together to tell um, the Libyans how they could improve their country and uh, how that would be helped by, uh, by their intervention. And you hear them all talking about democracy and you almost have to wonder whether you're dreaming because these are people who, less than three months ago, supported every single dictator in the region. Hillary Clinton was the woman who said, when the Egyptians first rose up against Mubarak, that both sides should show restraint. She said exactly the same thing about Bahrain last week, that both sides have to show restraint, as if there's somehow a sort of equivalence between tanks and guns and repressive dictatorship and people demonstrating without any weapons on the streets of their capital city and occupying their squares and uh, all the other things that people have done so heroically in the, uh, in the region. We also should remember that the three countries which have sold most arms to Libya in recent years have been Italy, France and the United Kingdom. In other words, the people who are now most keen about prosecuting the war. And it seems to me that when you look, for example, at the British role in this, since 2005, more than 100 million euros worth of arms have been sold by Britain alone to Gaddafi and his regime. And yet these are people who turn around now and say they care about humanitarian intervention and they care about what happens to civilians on the ground. The truth is that they don't care about any of those things. They don't care about what happens to ordinary people trying to fight for democracy. They didn't care in Tunisia. They didn't care in Egypt. They certainly don't care in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Yemen and all the other places where people are campaigning over these issues. What they are saying is they want to control the region at all costs and they will do what it takes in these circumstances to make sure that they control the region at all costs. If they can do it by backing the existing dictators, they will. If they find they can no longer do business with these people, then they will try to overthrow them. That is the lesson that Sammy, Sammy is absolutely right about in terms of the same time as they launched the intention of the no-fly zone over Libya was exactly the time when they also said to the Bahrainis, we will allow you to crack down on your demonstrators. We will allow you to do all these kind of things. And we have to see it in this context. When you hear them talk about humanitarian intervention, you really think after 10 years of this, more than 10 years of this, because it goes back to Kosovo, it goes back right, the whole of the neoliberal agenda for the last 20 years has been about humanitarian intervention, that the West's military intervention will somehow do some people some good. You look at what it has meant over the last 10 years in particular. I don't know if people read Malalai Joya's article in The Guardian today. She was an MP, a very brave young woman MP in Afghanistan. And they have a quota for women MPs in the Afghan parliament following the occupation. This is obviously a great step forward. But she was so intimidated and coerced by the people who ran the parliament, she could no longer continue to be an MP. Malalai Joya, in her article, talks firstly about the fact that she has been barred from going to the United States of America to do a speaking tour. This is in a supposedly a democracy where they don't want to hear about what is going on in Afghanistan. And they've also uh, done so because the main thing that she talks about is the hideous photographs that you can see, but which haven't been very much publicised in Britain or anywhere else in the West, the hideous photographs of the kill squads of American soldiers who have shot with impunity 
Afghan people, Afghan civilians, where they deliberately staged provocations and then shot them, got them so they looked like they were throwing hand grenades where they were doing nothing of the sort, and then took pictures of them, trophy pictures of them, in exactly the way that the American soldiers did in Abu Ghraib in Iraq. That is what humanitarian intervention really means. That is what it means. It means... It means the repression of a whole people. Sammy's talked about it in terms of Iraq. In The Guardian this week, there was also an article about The Guardian got under Freedom of Information uh, legislation. They got uh, information about the number of claims paid out, the money that's paid out um, to Afghan civilians for injury, death, um, destruction of crops, and all sorts of other things. According to this, the number of successful claims by civilians in Afghanistan has been more than two million. Of those, incidents with at least one fatality has been more than a quarter of a million people. Now, we've never heard these kind of figures of death. I don't, you almost wonder whether they are accurate. I'm sure they are accurate, but they have never been published by anybody before. And the only way we can get them is by looking at the amount of compensation that is being paid. The compensation is incidentally absolutely pathetic and nothing can compensate for the terrible things that have happened. But this tells you the level of deaths that must have gone on in Afghanistan, run into hundreds of thousands, not the tens of thousands that we were already told. The numbers of deaths in Iraq have run into more than a million, not the small figures that the government always tells us. So therefore, when we hear about humanitarian intervention, we have heard this before, and we should know, after all these years, exactly what this means in terms of the death and destruction that is going to happen. And when you hear as well about double standards, you know, when you mention the fact that there might be a different way of approaching these things, that maybe the standards applied to Libya are not the same as the standards which apply to Saudi or Bahrain or any of these other countries, uh, politicians and a lot of people in the media say, well, just because we can't intervene everywhere doesn't mean we shouldn't intervene anywhere, which they obviously think is a fantastically clever argument. But actually, if you think about this, if humanitarian intervention is such a good idea, firstly, why aren't they intervening everywhere? If this is the way that you do stop humanitarian disasters, then why don't they do it when Israel bombs Gaza? Why don't we have a no-fly zone there? <laughs> but also, we have to recognise that these double standards are accidental. It's not that they suddenly woke up one day and realised that women are oppressed in Afghanistan, but haven't noticed that they're oppressed in Saudi Arabia, for example. That's not what's happening. What's happening is there is a political agenda behind these double standards, which means they will turn a blind eye to repression, to brutality, to all the things that go on. In some countries, but they will not do in others where it suits their political convenience. That is the truth of the matter. It's been the truth with Saddam Hussein, it's the truth now with Gaddafi, it has been the truth all the way when they talk about these things. We have to understand what is going on here. Firstly, this intervention is about regime change. There is no question that what the West wants to do is to get rid of Gaddafi and replace him with somebody who is more amenable to them, or is more amenable to them now. Of course, he was very acceptable to um, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and all these other people when they were selling them arms and when they were getting oil and gas in return. He's not acceptable to them now, so they want to replace him. In fact, it is very hard to see how the West will be able to do business with Libya, which is what they want to do, without regime change. That is what they are talking about. The problem they have is that, of course, as Kate has spelled out, this is completely illegal under the terms of the, uh, under international law. It's completely beyond the terms of the Resolution 1973, and therefore they have a problem, which is why, when you look at the mess they are now in, they don't really know what to do. I don't know what they thought, that they were going to impose a no-fly zone, a couple of days of bombing, and it would all be over. That clearly is not the situation, and the situation is going to be much more difficult for them. But this aim of regime change, I was quite shocked when I watched the um, Andrew Marr show on Sunday morning, um, 
when he said, don't you think it would be a good idea to assassinate Gaddafi? Um, now, you do expect the BBC to kind of hold back from these kind of... Well, I do anyway. Maybe I've got too many illusions in the, um, in the BBC. But this idea that the BBC is cheering on this idea of regime change, the idea that the, uh, the MPs vote in their overwhelming majority to support this, and you would have thought, you know, the, all right, the first time may be understandable, the second time looks like carelessness, the third time looks like a willful dereliction of duty and a willful inability to understand what is going on in the world, which is rather shocking when you think these are the people who are supposed to be our elected representatives. Now, the message we want to send from this meeting is that we say hands off Libya, we don't want any intervention in Libya, and we believe that any intervention is going to lead to a much, much worse war, to much stronger imperialist intervention in the region. It's very interesting, people have referred to the opinion polls. The opinion poll yesterday said that 71% agreed that Libya, the military action in Libya could result in Britain being dragged into a prolonged conflict like the Iraq war. 71% think that's a likely thing. 47% disagree that the government was right to commit British armed forces to Libya. There is a, a majority already, 43% were in favour of it, but 47% against it. There are already more people against this intervention than are in favour of it. And that, it seems to me, reflects, firstly, that nobody can really see what on earth is um, what on earth is happening here, but more importantly that people can see the impact of 10 years of wars, 10 years of wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the effect this has had on Palestine, on Lebanon, on Somalia, on all these other places, and they don't want it anymore. That is why we have to campaign. It is a difficult campaign because people look at it and they think, firstly, I think lots of people believed it wasn't really going to be a very destructive thing. It would just be a no-fly zone without understanding. As Sammy has said, the history of the no-fly zone in Iraq was the build-up to war. It wasn't the alternative to war. It was the preparing the ground for war, just as the sanctions were preparing the ground for war. And this is what we are getting, uh, getting again. But people believe that maybe this will be over soon. It isn't like Iraq yet, but it can become like Iraq. It will be a poison in the centre of North Africa and the Middle East. It will be a poison in the heart of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions. It will make it much, much harder for people to achieve democracy in all those places. And that is why we have to oppose it. There's one final reason I want to say why we should oppose it. It's not the main reason, because I believe this war is wrong anyway, and therefore the cost of it is a secondary question. If I believed it was right, the cost might not be important, but I believe that this war is wrong, even if it costs nothing. But as a matter of fact, it costs billions and billions of pounds to wage these wars. We calculated the other day, we were on the demonstration on Saturday, the TUC demonstration against the cuts. We calculated that by the time of the next election, if that is in four years' time, the cost of continuing with Trident, the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the cost of the war in Libya, all the related costs of that will come to £25 billion. Pounds. That is a third already of the deficit that they say they want to cut. Now, what kind of a country do we live in that cannot find money for libraries or for disabled people or for school children or all of those things, but can find money to spend on war? And for that reason, as well as the others, let's change... against this war as part and parcel of campaigning for a better, for a more equal and fairer society and say this rotten government, this rotten government which claims that it is, is acting in the interest of people in Libya, isn't acting in their interest, is not acting in our interest either. Thank you.